And we're live. Darius Arya. Hello, my friend. How are you? Good. How are you doing? <laughs> Very good. Good. Who's in, currently in Rome. And uh, we call you an archaeologist, TV host with a PhD in classical ar uh, archaeology. My gosh. It's hard to say that. Uh, from Austin, University of Austin. And uh, yeah, we we'll call him a proper expert on Roman history. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. University of Texas in Austin. So we do this, we hook them horns. So that's the, that's a symbol, which obviously is very bad in, uh, in Italian. That's if you want to flip somebody off in traffic, but in, in Texas, it, it's very positive. Um, and that was, that was great. Living in Austin was, was wonderful, but I've been in Rome for almost 25 years. So Rome is home currently in Rome. And that's pretty much you know, the way it works. I, I don't know where else I could live, to be honest with you. Well, I have to say, Rome, one of my favorite places I've ever been. And I, um, thanks to your wife, who I've known for a long, long time, when I left the, I left the uh, army, I drove across Europe, effectively, from Cyprus to Rome. And she said, yeah, come and stay with me. So I, I, I slept on her sofa for, I think it was a couple of weeks, actually. She wow. went away and came back and all sorts. And I, I went full Roman. I, I hired the Vespa, got yeah. the fancy leather jacket, wraparound nice. sunglasses, <laughs> and just and just crewed around on a moped, getting lost, finding yes. amazing places. And at the time, Erica, your wife, was writing uh, guidebooks. Yep. For the different um, area, the different um, neighborhoods of Rome. So she would mm -hmm. invite me. She's like, "Come with me. We're going to go and try the best ice cream in Trastevere, or, or the best hot chocolate in Rome." Oh, things like she's, that. she's the expert on hot I know. It, so it was World a dream. Expert. I had a, a couple of weeks. That was my decompression from leave, from the military. I spent uh -huh. a couple of weeks in Rome and then up to the Alps. In fact, I know where I am now, actually, nice. as it happens. So I, I did, and this is one of my, my, always one of my, when I go to places like Rome or Jerusalem or any of these ancient places, is that I'm wandering around and I just wish I knew what the hell was going on here. So we have a, um, my wife and I, for when our kids are a bit older, we're going to go into Rome, get you, show us around. <laughs> I'm just going to look, use local experts. When we're going to go to the pyramids, we're going to get a prop, one of the best guides you can get. Yeah. And then just, so, because it's, it's a, so frustrating when you walk into um, an, an ancient church, like a properly old, old church, and there's things there, and you think, wow, that's, that's, that's beautiful, that's amazing. And then you realize afterwards, when you go and check it out, that it was like a Michelangelo something or, or Donatello or oh, yeah. any of the other yeah, teenage it's, it's, uh, Ninja Turtles. It's incredible and the depth you, you of You miss so uh, much. Uh, and so know, I actually one day is, did take a guide. I joined a, a, a guided tour of, um, of, of the Vatican and got into the Vatican Museum and the Sistine Chapel. And it was empty. It was just us, basically. It was in November. It was, it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. So, so you're in Rome. And uh, what are you doing in Rome currently? Uh, you know, currently I'm, I'm living in Rome, so that's kind of what I'm doing. But uh, I have a small excavation in Foligno with some colleagues, which is near Perugia, of a small amphitheater. Uh, doing a lot of uh, production of videos. So I have a nonprofit. It's called Ancient Rome Live. It's been around for 20 years, and we have a learning platform. So we get access to exhibitions, and we're filming in Pompeii or whatever. It's all educational and you can find that on YouTube. It's Ancient Rome Live. Started up my own YouTube channel, just my yeah. name, Darius Aria, and you can find and, uh, me on all social media. It's one of my and that's more of the adventure kind nowadays. of travel y thing. Sometimes I'm traveling with Erica, sometimes I'm traveling on my own. I just spent a lot of time in Greece this past fall. Uh, went to Al uh, Albania in last spring. So I'm just you know doing what I can also to get around and to give insights on places that people uh, might not normally go to. So. Yeah. And then I, I just filmed some things for Nat Geo. I have a project with PBS, so a lot of TV. And uh, I, I work for The Great Courses, which is a great uh, program in the U.S. And it's online learning. So I'm doing a lecture series on Mediterranean cities as we speak. So that's a lot of, uh, a lot of lecturing. And uh, just living in Rome is just a great adventure. I mean, every day there's something new. Uh, yesterday... A friend of mine says, hey, come to this Christmas concert. So I said, okay. And it was inside Palazzo Pamphili, this magnificent papal palace, 17th century, in Piazza Navona, which is now the Brazilian embassy. So hello, Mr. Ambassador. Thanks for having me and 
it was a little Christmas caroling and so forth. And it was a chance to, to walk through the residential portion of the palace. So there's all kinds of great experiences living in Rome. And mainly it's because, you know, I just hang out with the locals, you know, I'm a local myself. And, uh, and I think there's nothing better than living in Rome or in Italy and having the local Italian experience. So I'm yeah. not, I'm, I'm not living in a bubble speaking. I mean, I speak English all the time, of course, but I'm, I'm not in that bubble of, uh, living, you know, and, and, and doing my reality with English speakers. It's more like, Hey, the gatekeepers, you know, are the Italians work with the Italians in archeology span and historical preservation, art history and so forth, you know, yeah. neighbors, parents of kids that go to school with my kids and so on. Perfect. Yeah. It's important to learn the language and, and speak with the locals because uh, otherwise you're just an expat and that's, no one likes that. The worst. Especially the worst. Me. Yeah. So we're, we're actually yeah. going to, we're going to, we're going to talk. The reason I reached out to you about this is because yeah. the, there was a, a lot of memes lately about what are, what are men thinking about? And it's the, well, I'm just thinking about the fall of the Roman empire. And so I thought, I know a guy, I know, yeah. or I know of a guy who can help me out on this. So interestingly enough, you are of Persian descent. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I was reading, this is one of my, actually my favorite stories from the Roman empire mm -hmm. and, uh, about, um, Valerian emperor Valer Valerian. Oh. Yeah. who got captured by checks notes what was his name king shapur the first there we go yeah and um so this from what i've read for, yeah. and i've did it from different various different sources was one of the first times i think probably maybe the first time an emperor had been captured an actual yeah. emperor because he went across there to fight and yeah, got that's captured not it was not a good it was not a good moment no he he was kept as a personal slave used as a yeah. footstool so he yeah. could get to the emperor the king could get on his horse yeah and then allegedly i yeah. thought this was a so the story goes exactly yeah. so the story goes he was then um killed skinned stuffed and then hung on his wall on the king's palace so that he could look on his uh you know his his foe his defeated foe. I don't know. And a lot of these things, like like a lot of history, it's written by the victors. And on their side, yeah. this is basically what they said happened. But that's the that's the that's the story yeah, we've I mean, got. But I mean, you know, you know, it's funny because um, you know there are periods of time for the Romans where we know so much. You know, we have the the letters and the the speeches of Cicero coming out our ears. I mean, you just. You just want to, you just want to die. I mean, you're a student and you're reading all, I'm like, who is this guy? He's so prolific and we have his stuff. So there's certain time periods like the decline of the Republic where we just know so many details and so many protagonists, the assassination of Julius Caesar and so on. And then there are other periods, particularly as we move forward in time, uh, where we don't have that much information. So we've got like, you know, these mega wars or these incredible moments in history. And it's just almost, you know, fragmentary in comparison. But we do know in that time period, we do know in this uh, moment of crisis uh, in the third century that uh, things were going very badly. And one of the reasons they're going very badly is that Romans are losing some pretty substantial uh, battles, but also because uh, at that point, the longevity of a reign of an emperor was kind of like the average uh, Italian government. You know, the average Italian government post-World War II lasts about 18 months. So how do you get any stability? Uh, you don't. And that's what the Roman Empire was. And it was a lot of just, you know, people within the same uh, factions or the, the Praetorian Guard or people in the military just, you know, taken out the emperor who was a general. And then next thing you know, you, the other general is now the emperor and so on and so forth. There was just a lot of internal strife as well as uh, external foes. Um, but it really is a, a fascinating period where we do not know that much at all, but definitely um, the, this, this, this new empire that Sassanids they're, I don't know, we, we sometimes say we're, they're more aggressive, but they definitely also saw versus the previous Persian people, the uh, the Parthians, 
who are, you know, big protagonists for most of the Roman Republic and in the first couple of centuries of the Roman Empire. Um, by the time we're getting the Sassanids in, they're they're looking at Rome and seeing Rome is kind of in disarray. Mm -hmm. That's why. So, you know, there's two sides of the coin. Are they more aggressive or they're actually saying, <laughs> these guys are not doing well at all. This would be the time. Uh, this would be the time to strike. Yeah. Just on a point on that, I was um, I follow this guy who's um, he's a finance um, money manager. Yeah. Made, made lots of money, huge money yeah. manager. And he collects <laughs> ancient coins and he uses mm -hmm. this for his. And what he does is he will test the silver content uh -huh. yeah. of coinage. And yeah. he, he basically <clears throat> makes graphs that, that perfectly align with the, the well, we're going to come to this later on, but they perfectly yeah. align to peaks and troughs in civilization. It just goes back six, five, six thousand years because he uses yeah. things from um, Assyria <clears throat> and places like that. So, but, and it, it was one of his hordes is because mm. it was a uh, conventional archaeology at the time was that the, that there was a period of this particular emperor, and I, forget, I can't remember which one it was, was there for, I don't know, 10 years or whatever it was. But then they found a horde of coins, and that had, uh, like you said, it was like a transfer season in the, in the, in the football leagues mm. because uh, one guy would be in, and then he'd get murdered by the Praetorian Guard, and then they'd install their guy, and then he wouldn't. And it was basically, um, how would you even describe that? You'd d describe it as... Uh, you've got to pay the highest it goes to the highest bidder and if it's if they want more money if he doesn't pay them then he's gone and it was a period of well you tell us but and um there was loads of them and then you yeah. know, had to rewrite the history books because they found all these different emperors yeah and, and every, then, everyone's pouring their money everyone's pouring the money because once you're the emperor yeah. what do you do when you're claimed the emperor you immediately give <clears throat> a cash reward to the to the soldiers so also they they're they're motivated like hey I mean, this guy sucks if we get a new guy in, hey, we get another, we get another bonus. Get another um, payout. So yeah, and so everyone's coining. So then obviously you're getting a lot of debasing because one of the biggest costs of running the Roman Empire is paying the army. I mean that's that's the bottom line as well. Some sounds there's some similarities today. I would have thought. So yeah, but the military uh, doesn't get paid that well. <laughs> no, but the the I mean, the, you know, uh, the the arms manufacturers. These guys are getting a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, I had a little blackout there. So, yeah, we're talking about that um, Emperor Valerian there. So, yep. was is that because it, that caused panic in Rome? From what I can, yeah. I, I can mean, gather, it caused panic but, in Rome because uh, that's the first time it happened, and and the the confidence in the the government was severely tested. And I'm just wondering if does that tie in with the beginning of the decline in Rome or is that just, I mean, yeah, just another story. the decline, the decline of, of Rome. I mean, my goodness, there are so many different starting points. Um, I mean, first of all, it's there's Rome and the concept of the city of Rome, and then there's Roman empire. So Rome is going to be, uh, you know, marginalized over time because it's not so much of, Rome, the city anymore, and it's going to be about where the emperor is, where the emperor is located, fighting a war or whatever, uh, that that's where the central government really is. So you have the concept of Rome always present, but famously, you know, Rome is sacked in 410 AD and August 24th. And, and that's, you know, a big, you know, blip historically, but Rome had long since been marginalized as the capital. In fact, other capitals were created, uh, Previously, you know, there's there's Trier in Germany, the Sirmium on the Danube there in modern day Serbia, there's Thessalonike, there's Nicomedia, then there's Constantinople, there's also Mediolanum, which is Milan. So, you know, those are all new kind of mini Romes. And then, you know, you're eventually going to have multiple emperors, you know, senior emperors and junior emperors and co emperors. So, I mean, it, it's really complicated on that kind of front. Um, and you can also go back to say, even at the peak of the empire and the Antonines, when you have uh, the Germans attacking Northern Italy, Marcus Aurelius is going up there to fight against them. Uh, his co-emperor Lucius Verus, that most people forget about in history, but he, he fought against the Parthians. They contract probably, they think smallpox, bring it back to Rome. 
a lot of people are dying. And then, you know, so all these things kind of tie in together. So it's not just one particular moment, but, you know, we always have to look at the Roman Empire and Rome itself as something that evolves, something that is going to change over time. So we look at our, our world today and we're living, you know, we're living history. And then, you know, 10, 20 years, you know, we look back and go, oh, do you remember when that happened? Wow, here were the repercussions. This would ultimately would happen. But when you're living in that moment, you know, it might be dire, but then you see maybe it wasn't so bad or, you know, so it's, we have, a, we're lucky that we have the long lens of history. We can look at the Romans, but again, it's very, you know, things are very, very complicated. Uh, geopolitically, uh, what's the role of the emperor? What are the external forces? And, you know, ostensibly, you know, the external pressures on the empire are going to pick up and have some momentum with successive centuries as well. You know, the, the relationship with those people, uh, the change of the auxiliaries that are on the borders, who are those people? Uh, so it's, it's the, it, it ends up being very complicated very, very quickly. Um, and so you yeah. can't really put your, I mean, like, you know, there's maybe 200 reasons published, uh, in the past 200 years about why the Roman empire fell from lead poisoning, you know, to deforestation to, you know, it just ends up being very complicated the way that we can look at it. Just look at it today and say, and people like to look at it today and say, Oh, Pax Americana. This is the decline. This is the, this is the period where Rome is, de uh, America is declining. Do you know what I mean? But, you know, let's, let's go forward 50 years and look back. You know, we, we, we don't have that, we don't have that opportunity. Uh, or, so it ends mm. up being very, you know, it, what, what's your own agenda? Sure. You know, what's, what's your, what's your background? What's, how do you, how do you see the world? And that's going to influence. And, and this is, this is what influences the ancient historians that we're reading today. If we're reading a Tacitus or we're reading, uh, Scriptoris Historia Augustae, uh, one of our main sources for the later emperors, you know, we have to, we're, we're interpreting their interpretations and, and, and most of the people writing them, you know, they're from the upper classes. So we're, it's like, you know, the equivalent would be the only people that transmit the history are the Bill Gates and the Elon Musks. I mean, if those guys are writing history, <laughs> they definitely have their own bias, you know, as opposed to the guy that uh, kind of, you know, came from nothing, got an education and sat down and wrote a history like today. I mean, that's, so everything, you know, we have to sift through a lot of stuff. Mm. It makes it interesting, you know. It's so interesting. But the actual collapse itself, when the, 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 we talk about the, the, the collapse of Rome, the city itself, was, from certain sources I've read, very, very quick. And the, the, the population collapsed. And it was the most, over a million, or ex yeah. estimates over a million, million and a half people who lived in Rome. And mm. then that collapsed and didn't recover for many years later. In fact, the, the next city that became, that had the same population of ancient Rome, apparently, was Paris in the 18, mid-1800s, before that any other city in Europe, certainly, had yeah. achieved that same population. And um, in one account I read that it was, um, the, the population of Rome dropped massively within even eight years because people because of the, the, the collapses here, the, the monetary collapse, the, the financial collapse, the, the very high taxation got to the point which we've seen throughout history where people just leave because they say, well, we can't pay anymore. And then they, they leave. But I mean, we, what, do you think, we, what do you say to that? Yeah, we, we, have, we have written sources. We have tons of archaeology. So actually, in the past uh, several decades, there's been a huge influx in excavations that give us insights into What's happening in the, uh, they call this one period, I mean, it's made up term for this by historians, late antiquity. So what's late antiquity is that kind of, uh, that transition period from end of empire into, you know, the Christian era into, you know, middle ages. So they kind of carved out that space, fourth, fifth, sixth century. So let me just give you a little snapshot. Okay, Rome is sacked in 410. And like I was saying before, in 410, uh, it's basically people that were in the service of the empire Alaric the Goth, you know, he's, he's, the Goths are made to fight uh, for the Roman Empire in several cases, uh, but they're not actually enfranchised. Uh, they're not actually allowed to become Roman citizens. And ultimately, they want more rights and they, they're going to march on Rome. 
and uh, ultimately sack Rome. And that's 410. Now, things go on in Rome. You know, churches are being built. You have that uh, bit of the, the voice and the presence of the church, you know, taking hold. Uh, but it's still a kind of a showcase center for the Roman Empire, whose capital has become, you know, uh, previously, uh, you know, Constantinople under Constantine. And that's 410. We can move forward to 455, another mm. sack by the Vandals. Okay, this is still Rome. Now, the big, the big one is um, when you have the Gothic Wars, when enough is enough, and Justinian, the emperor of Constantine, uh, Constantinople says, I'm going to go and reclaim so much of what has been lost in the West. He reconquers, you know, he defeats the Vandals that have taken over North Africa. They come up into Italy, liberate Italy. But in the, in the process, we were told that we have the archaeological evidence, Rome is trashed. You know, like all the aqueduct lines are getting cut. I mean, it's just, it's devastated. Because first, uh, you know, Belisarius, the general of Justinian, he's taken over Rome. But then they're in turn besieged by the gods. It's just, it's just a back and forth. It's, it's just awful. And that really is something from which Rome's, you know, big population is, isn't going to uh, recuperate. So we're getting all the way now, well, this is in the 530s. And that's really when Rome's not going to recover. And that reconquering of the West never really worked. So one generation beyond uh, Justinian, it's over. Then we're going forward to basically, you, you know, in the 630s, about of Yamruk, uh, the Arabs have now previously devastated, run through the Sassanians, and now they're going after the Eastern Roman Empire. They're all, it's all on the, the brink of destruction, but Constantinople with its double wall circuit uh, resists, but the Arabs tear down through, take the Middle East, go through North Africa and pop up into uh, uh, Spain. So, and then they're gonna be stopped by the Franks. So they don't get into, you know, modern day France. That's the end of the Roman Empire. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's so many different snapshots and moments of time in which we, we can look at. But then we're talking about a small population in Rome. So it's not, not previously. Rome is kind of chugging along under Constantine and even, and even into, the, into the 5th century um, in international trade and so forth. But then it all, you know, kind of comes to that grinding halt. But other cities, you know, replace them in importance like Ravenna. And, and, and Milan, you know, and, and so forth, uh, to have some connection still with uh, Byzantium, you know, Constantinople. So it gets complicated uh, pretty fast, and the decline is not something, you know, just one moment. It's several moments for several factors. Yeah, for the for the then it never, yeah, but never really recuperates. So you can jump forward into the Renaissance or something and say it's like a hundred thousand people living here. Maybe it's three hundred thousand when there's a pilgrimage, you know, for the Jubileo year. But yeah, Rome's never going to be what it once was. And when they make it the capital of unified Italy in 1870, they're like, this is basically a medieval city. You know, we need big boulevards. We need to make this look like Paris. You know, we need to knock down buildings and, you know, have tram lines and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and that's just going to take place so late. So, so much of yeah. that ancient material is, was preserved underneath the medieval layers. It's uh, it's funny that you, when you mentioned before about the, the Goths revolted, uh, was it the Goths? Yes, uh, because uh, they weren't given Roman citizenship, so therefore they couldn't vote. So it's uh, the no taxation with the right, without representation all over again. It's a bit like 1776 in the States. So yeah, I, mean, I was going to yeah, ask I mean, the, the question: Why why was Constantinople, current now Istanbul, mm -hmm. uh, why was that chosen as the? Because if I get this right, the the empire was split into two western and the eastern there was an emperor in rome and there was an emperor in constantinople but why was constantinople then chosen as the second city of the empire yeah it's a great question i mean you know we can we can go back even to before the empire is east and west i mean it's always east and west because it's it's a greek world in the east and it's it's a latin world in the west uh, but like when octavian made that deal with mark antony you know and they divvy up the empire. Octavian's in the West and Mark Antony goes to the big mega city, which was Alexandria, you know, for Egypt. And he shacks up with Cleopatra and so forth. But basically it was always this East and West, East and West. And if we're going to run it, then we got to be one in the East and one in the West. So as a precursor, a precursor to Constantinople, there were these other 
capitals that were mainly placed along the frontier, like Trier in Germany and Sirmium in, in Serbia and so forth, that's in the UK and Greece. Uh, and the and the town uh, that's prior to um, Constantinople is Nicomedia, but it gets devastated by an earthquake. So Byzantium is the city, a Greek city that does exist, which is Greek and then becomes Roman and is, you know, trashed over time, but it's refounded by uh, Constantine. He said, this is a great place. This is, this is an ideal place for a new Rome. Uh, so he kind of made it happen. But there were other, you know, great cities, Seleucia on the Tigris and Antioch on the Orontes. I mean, there are other mega cities, but, uh, you know, part of the reason the failure of some of those other cities is that it's very, you know, look at that devastation in Turkey just this past year. I mean, it, there's a lot of seismic activity. Um, and so a lot of those other great cities are, are, are devastated and don't really recuperate. And even Constantinople has, 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 uh, you know, undergone, uh, you know, damage, you know, from earthquakes, but it's the one that has the longevity. So you have the East and West idea present in the minds of the Romans for a very long time. And Diocletian, you know, he's got the two senior emperors and two junior emperors, uh, that's kind of a short-lived idea. It breaks down and then you get, you know, the rise of one guy and that's Constantine, then Constantine and his three sons. And he's kind of divvying up the empire. And, you know, and then in the end, it's just, you know, everything goes badly, let's say, with the invasions and the migrations and the pressures from that in the West. It's not the same reality in the East. And that's one of the reasons why the East lives on another thousand years. They consider themselves Romans. Forget about the Byzantine Empire and stuff like that. Those guys were Romans. So that's something that, you know, you don't really get in your history books. You get it like there's something different. But they were they were, they were Rome. They were New Rome. I know. It's, it, pe most people don't realize that, that the Roman Empire didn't officially terminate until they were taken over by the, by the, um, the Turks. In yeah, the yeah, 1453. 16th, 16th century, 1600s. And 1453, and but I mean, but prior, you did have this crazy fourth crusade with the sack in the early 13th century. That was that was a biggie too, like 1204. So, ah, okay, yeah. But I mean, like, it's over. It's really over. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, yeah, with Mehmet the Second, exactly. Yeah, and they and and the um, the Ottoman Empire went. They were knocking on the gates of Vienna. And yeah. that's another thing that people yeah, exactly. probably don't realize. And it wasn't that long ago. It was not that long ago. And, uh, you know, hope, hope history doesn't repeat again. But yeah, I, yeah, I didn't so the, Yeah. Oh, I dropped out. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, because they didn't. Yeah, because um, when they, they, I just mentioned about the fact that we hope that uh, that history doesn't repeat and that's one thing that um, if you look at history, you read that you realize it does. It repeats all the time, which is uh, sad, but uh, the way it is at the moment. And all, yeah. I, all I would like to, uh, to, to mention now is I'll go back to you, you mentioned the equivalents of the Bill Gates or the, or the Elon Musk's writing the history. Yeah. Was yeah. there, in your opinion, was there, was there like, uh, it seems to, the evidence would point to it, but is there any sort of concrete evidence of... Uh, a deep state back in those Roman times towards the end. I mean, what, what happens with the, so let's go back in time. Rome is founded by Romulus. Then there are Kings. These Kings, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, hereditary. They actually select their Kings, vote them in. The monarchy ends and you have a Republic. And when we look at that Republic today, it's like a monarchy. I mean, excuse me, excuse me, it's an oligarchy, excuse me. So uh, the early Republic was really about that handful of just, you know, educated families. You know, politicians weren't paid. They, they, they actually contributed their own funds. Um, and, and so you had a, a small select amount of people. And, and through the history of the Republic, it's between 300 and 600 senators. Then you get... Uh, the, the monarchy that's uh, inserted, you know, from Julius Caesar's dictator, perpetuous, perpetual dictator, then, uh, then Augustus kind of finessing it. And so nobody ever wants to say I'm a king, but that's what we're getting. We're getting uh, monarchy again. And then you select the senators. They're not elected anymore. So you're pretty much getting rid of the right to vote. But you're, you're, you're creating other opportunities for 
the stratified society to ascend, for example, running the local cult of the divinized emperor and so on. And, um, and that goes on, you know, for, for quite some time, but the build out, the eventuality of having the uh, monarchy is that you get the court. So the people that are in that inner circle of the emperor, the people that are dining with the emperor, the people that are socializing and so forth, they're going to be closer to that center of power. And, 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 and obviously, you know, conspiracies are hatch and it's, it's, it's from that small network. I don't know. I don't call that the deep state per se, but it's like, these are the people that ultimately realize, Hey, I'm so close. You know, if we knock off the emperor, one of us can replace him. So you have that, you need that educated base. You need those people uh, to interact with and ultimately be designated as governors of uh, provinces and so forth. So, but you need to have them in your kind of retinue. Then you're traveling and they're coming with you and so forth. So that's a very big embedded uh, reality of not that many people. And then by the third century, another big protagonist, much more, let's say, muscular and vocal in their decisiveness is the army. And the army says, ho, ho, we can make, we can decide who the emperor is. And you kind of get uh, uh, an insertion of a new level of stratified bureaucracy as a response to kind of dilute those powers, both of the people within the 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 retinue of the emperor as well as uh, the military people and that's under diocletian and then you get to, you know constantine you get some sort of stability in a kind of oh the good times are rolling again uh, so rome's kind of going up and down but throughout you have these like you said these power players or brokers you know in the julio claudian period it was a lot of freedmen and even slaves of the imperial family that became protagonists unheard of for a lot of Romans, like what the heck, this guy's a slave. But if you are part of the familia, the family of the emperor, it included your slaves and your freed slaves. So in that sense, you're getting different kinds of developments of power centers and power brokers. Uh, so I don't know, in term deep state, I mean, I, I don't think it really applies in the same way, but there definitely were these no. important pockets of power that didn't previously have a voice. One other thing that seems to be recurring mm -hmm. is the, for us in, in certainly, well, no, it's worldwide now is yep. soccer, football, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And it's the, this, the, the, the theme of the bread and circuses. If you keep them, keep them fed and entertained, they won't revolt. Yeah. And I don't know what, if, what do you think about that? I mean, definitely in Rome, what you see, the trend is going back to the Republic as they were more successful and they're just knocking off kingdoms and they're bringing in so much capital. What do they do with that capital? They spent it on the people. So the people are getting, you know, the grain dole, for example, that's first it's subsidized cost of grain. Then finally it's free. It's not because the people were the starving masses. It's like, this is a benefit of empire. And you as a citizen, you can come and collect grain every month. It, you're entitled to it. It's not because you're poor. You're entitled to it. And, uh, and so that's where a lot of the expenditure was. I mean, there are breakdowns in the Roman economy. Like I was saying before, a, a big part of the economy in the Roman Empire is maintaining that army. But another part of it is a lot of the money initially, it goes to Rome. It's like, why am I in Rome? Why, why am I not somewhere else in the empire? I mean, Rome was the end all be all for so many centuries. We just have so much here. I mean, so, you know, you go to Pompeii and it's better preserved because of the destruction from Vesuvius. Ephesus is wonderful in Turkey and left this magna in Libya, which you can't visit now. But, you know, Rome, it's like living here. It's a Rome on a Rome on a Rome on a Rome. You can see parts of the sixth century Rome. You can see parts of Neolithic Rome. You can see Republican Rome. You can see Imperial Rome of various centuries. So they just, they had the capital to rebuild again and again and again. I mean, there's just nothing like it. And then if you look at, I mean, I was with a, a friend of mine, real connoisseur of, of, uh, of, of Roman art, particularly Renaissance art. We're in this palace in Palazzo Pamphili yesterday. 
And it's like, yeah, Venice has a lot of palaces, but nothing compares to Rome. So you, you don't get that feeling uh, of it as you walk through Rome, but there are so many uh, family palaces. It's insane. And they have so much of that ancient Roman art that was rediscovered. I mean, there's just, just the richness that's here is, is truly unparalleled. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's where a lot of the money went. And, and it also went into entertainment. <clears throat> so you'd have a games, the games of the Ludi Romani, and it starts off at three days. And next thing you know, it's 15 in the calendar. So, you know, <clears throat> we have the, the work, the work, the work week, you know, is eight day weeks. And by the time it's all said and done, you probably got a hundred days of festivals in the, in the, in the, in the time of the emperors. I mean, it's just insane. So is anybody working? And so I, I'm here living in Italy and, and I grew up in America and it's like, Ooh, we have a lot of holidays. Ooh, another holiday. And then a lot of them are Catholic yeah. holidays as much of Europe. Where did a lot of those Catholic holidays come from? Oh, they were from ancient Roman holi pagan holidays. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's incredible. Uh, the, the, we still feel the impact of, of, of what Rome achieved and it made its way into the Christian calendar. But there's a lot of, a lot of partying, yeah, a, you know, a lot of partying, a lot of free entertainment, a lot of barbecues, you know, a lot of, a lot of bulls were sacrificed uh, and a lot of, you know, theatrical productions, chariot races, but the bulk of them ostensibly are on the occasion of a festival honoring a god. So it ties in very nicely. It's not just simply, hey, it's soccer season. Hey, it's ice hockey season. No, these things are in the calendar that were tied originally to the agriculture. And you want to have a good relationship with the deity so that you have a good harvest and so on and so forth. And you, yeah. you, you, you honor the gods that are protecting you. And since you're so successful, yeah, fair. you up the ante. And that just becomes, yes, yeah. bread and circuses. But it's, it's always tied to the connection with the deities. Exactly, yeah. Well, that uh, free grain for everyone sounds a lot like universal basic income, doesn't it? <laughs> when you, yeah, we don't got that, that but yeah, unless you're like in Norway or something. Yeah. <laughs> We're still aiming yeah, for that one. Bit, yeah, it's a different uh, one. But yeah, I mean, like, like yeah. Rome, and, yeah, Rome was dirty, Rome was crowded, uh, the streets you know, it's like a pedestrian mall and it's packed. It's like more Calcutta than it is New York City. I mean, it's just packed. But it's because everyone walked. Mm. How big could a city become? Well, the city was the biggest city. Uh, so it was massive. If you visit it today and you're like, woo, I just walked from the Vatican to the Colosseum in about 35 minutes, you know, it's not that big. So by modern standard, it's not that big. But, you know, this was a city that wasn't built with a car in mind. So it's just packed and dense with so much stuff. Um, you know, you couldn't afford, you know, that's why they had, they had their apartment buildings and multiple storied uh, dwellings because you couldn't afford a house. The land was very, it was at a premium. So it, 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 uh, it, w it was quite an amazing city to say the least. Yeah. It's a bit like Jerusalem. If you, I'm assuming you've been to Jerusalem, but I, yeah. I've been there once and tiny. Uh, it's tiny. <laughs> it is tiny. Tiny. And you think this is a center of conflict for thousands of years unbelievable thousands of years and it's it's literally tiny you could walk around it in i don't know half an hour maybe yeah no, it's, on the yeah. on the walls i don't know maybe a bit longer yeah so it's and that's i find that funny and you meant you mentioned the the roman catholic church or the well certainly our church as well now yeah um subsuming these pagan as they call them pagan holidays and uh, yep. we're just a few weeks away from saturnalia Yep. Christmas. Yep. yep. Which, a couple days, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that brings me to something else I wanted to ask you about yeah. is this theory of that the Roman Empire never died. Uh, it just the, the Catholic Church <clears throat> yep. took over. And, uh, and I know very little about this subject, so I'm hoping you're going to enlighten, enlighten yeah. me. But yeah. there was a period of time in Europe, what we call the Dark Ages, that was the Holy, it was called the Holy Roman Empire, which lasted yeah. a long time. Yep. Again, I know very little about it, but what, okay. is your, what are your thoughts on that? That seems to be the golden thread from ancient Rome to now yeah. is still the church. Again, yeah. Again, we have in the past several decades, we have uh, so much archaeology, so much attention toward these periods of time. And we understand it much better. And of course, uh, anyone who's studied this period understands now that the dark ages weren't so dark. Uh, you know, so there's just there's a lot of life. There's a lot of uh, you know, 
trade. There's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things are happening, but you know, ostensibly in a town like Rome, right? The resources aren't there like they were, you know, once before there's challenges because there's a smaller population and so on. But what happens is, you know, if you're not going to have a vacuum when you have the demise of the Roman empire, someone's going to fill it in and it ends up being the Pope. And of course, because they lose, the Romans lose the control of the Mediterranean, which they used to call Mare Nostrum, our sea, you know, that's, that's going to radically, uh, you know, uh, break the con contact in the East. So Rome's going to fashion itself essentially as the Jerusalem of the West. You can't, we lose the Holy Land. You can't go there. So it's all about Rome, Rome, Rome. We got Peter, we got Paul, you know, we got, we got all these relics. So they really build themselves up. And so then people are taking land routes, the pilgrimage routes to come to Rome that enriches Rome, allows them to build. And of course, earlier on, you know, we see that they are, that they, you know, don't agree with some of these politics. They'll just, uh, you know, kick them out of the church, which has a, a profound effect uh, in the early, uh, middle ages. So they're, they're like kingmakers. Um, and they're eventually, you know, they're, that, that, that procedure will change, but, um, you know, Rome is going to become wealthy in a different kind of way. And there will be, you know, a lot of building, there'll be a lot of, you know, tearing down of ancient monuments and refurbishing them and burning down the marble for lime for concrete. And so Rome is going to change, but definitely, I mean, I, again, one of the reasons why I'm here the reason why Rome is so fascinating and it's really without parallel is because you didn't have a lull. Um, yeah, the population decreases, but you had another full on rich development architecturally. I mean, you know, everything philosophically, economically, I mean, all these things are happening. But when you look at all these other amazing cities, historically a Damascus or an Alexandria or right, they just, it just, just the decline, they never recuperate in the same way. So the fact that Rome eked on a second life as the capital of what we call the Holy Roman Empire, different kind of influence. And then you have it become the capital of Italy. You know, Italy's capital when they unified first was Torino and then it was Florence. And then for nostalgic purposes, you know, it's Rome. Probably would have been better off, <laughs> been a better run if it had been somewhere in the north, but Rome it is. So we're just, you know, have so much going on through so many periods in one city. And I, I don't think there is any other city that that can claim that. And and uh, yeah, it's 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 really astounding. It's pretty cool because when you think yeah. I live north of you. And in fact, I live very close to the Italian border. I can drive there in about half an hour just to the border. So you've got the, the it's called the St. Bernard Pass, San Bernardo. So you've yeah. got the monastery of San Bernard and they've got the dogs. They have a dog breeding program up there. It's pretty cool. You go there in the summer and they're all sitting on the You can see all these wow. St. Bernard puppies and the big ones running around. It's, it's, very, it's very cool. So but we're, the nearest big, ta big town to where I am is called Martigny. It used to be called Octodur. Okay. Uh, I think that's how it's pronounced. That's how it's spelled anyway. And uh, there is a amphitheater, a Roman mm -hmm. amphitheater still there. Yeah. yeah. They've ex excavated it. And there's, um, so I guess and it would, would have been a city, uh, um, a, a town of importance because you've got that pass coming in from the north of Italy yeah. over the top of the Alps into, and then you've got your access to, to Germany, northern Switzerland, France, et cetera, et cetera. So it would have yeah. been a very important trade route. And uh, it's just, you think about all these things. And I drive up there, I say it takes half an hour to drive up, but that would have been hard, hard, hard work if yeah. you had to walk up. It's a long, and it goes up high. It's, it's over two and a half thousand meters up there. Or take an army. And it's, uh, <laughs> or, or take an army. Yeah, that's yeah. one, that's a fascinating one. Um, yeah. The Hannibal story, but that was yeah. the other one. Well, actually, I don't believe they know exactly which valley he used, but they think it followed the Isère, so by yeah, the Val they're, they're, kind of areas. That, I didn't follow it, but I remember at one point some scholar, I thought it was from Stanford, I think he, I think he said he found like you know some trace layer of maybe a, a elephant dung or something like that. I don't remember the deal now, but everyone's trying to trace you know where Hannibal went. But the bottom yeah. line is he did do it. I mean, he did do something. 
that no one ever expected. The Romans were like, that's a barrier for us. That's a, that's a wall. That's a protection. No, no way possible can an army come through that. So he just defied expectations. So even though we, we, we still struggle, we play the game, we do our research, we know that it happened. And that was something, I mean, literally, I mean, you can kind of joke about, but it's like, you know, he had that possibility of wiping, wiping out Rome, wiping out the city. And then we'd all be learning how, you know, Carthaginian history and how wonderful the Carthaginians are. And you know, <laughs> instead we're left with like these stories of, and the Carthaginians sacrificed their babies, of which they did in part. But, um, you know, so it's just this kind of, you know, whoever the victor is, they're going to be telling that story about the other people. But the Romans had respect for Hannibal, one of the greatest generals of antiquity. Maybe the greatest. I mean, yeah, really he was amazing. Yeah, he was something else. Yeah. I, I, there's a, have you ever heard of a guy called Dan Carlin? He does a podcast yeah. Yeah, yeah, called yeah, yeah. Hardcore sure, Histories. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, he's fantastic. So that's where I get my knowledge of these, of these things from. He does a he really deep dives on these subjects. But they apparently, once the, the Roman army figured out how to neutralize the effect of the elephants, because apparently if you, you point them in one direction and they've been trained to go and just kill whatever's in front of them, the, the Romans figured out that if you open up large channels in between and shepherd them through, after that, they've got, they're like unguided missiles and they'll just attack anything. So they ended up... Yeah. And, and turning them back towards the, uh, to the, the, the Carthaginians, and it caused chaos amongst their ranks. But subsequently, from what I read, the, the, the Romans went to Carthage and absolutely <laughs> leveled the place and killed, killed yeah. everyone. They, 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 I mean, they, they're just so paranoid. So, I mean, the Third Punic War is essentially looking for an excuse to take them out. And, and actually, you can read about it. I mean, it's, you know, 149 of 146. I mean, it wasn't a cakewalk at all. I mean, this was a very heavily fortified city. It was very, very difficult. They had a lot of setbacks. But ultimately, uh, you know, the end happened. And that's where you dismantle the walls and, you know, sell off the population for slavery and so on. But when Hannibal, you know, won those two big victories, Chazamine and um, Kenai, he went to survey the walls of Rome. And he really thought, okay, can we besiege the city? And ultimately, he did not. And the Romans then say historically, boy, that was a mistake. You know, that was that was a mistake. I mean, mm. ah, that I was his chance. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, he, so he continued to say, he "I'll just go on and, and 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 you know, get other cities to turn on my side and leave." Most most cities did not abandon the Romans, these allies. Uh, but he thought he could turn them and have a larger army wow. and so forth and win that way. And it just, it was, he was wrong. He, he should have besieged Rome. It's just a, one of those mysterious, mysterious twists, twists of fate. Of fate. And yeah. that was something that I'm going to, I'm going to go away from Rome a little bit here. We're going to go okay. across to a place called Scotland. And I'm going to ask you, why did, what is the real reason that Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian built that wall? that separates now Scotland and England. Well, I mean, you have this long history of Romans being very interested in Britain, starting with really Julius Caesar as he's, you know, conquering Gaul. Uh, you have a real, you know, the first big triumph against the Britons is Claudius. Uh, and you're moving forward, then uh, you have Domitian. So you have a number of wars just, you know, conquering, you know, more territory. And... Um, so you kind of have a, kind of this definitive barrier, you know, this is as far as we're going to take it. And yet, and yet, you know, you know, Domitian had pushed forward in his wars and then you get the Antonine wall, which is substantially, you know, north of the Hadrianic wall. So, you know, it's not, even though, you know, they have this wall set up, which is really, you know, taking advantage of the landscape and the natural cliffs and so forth is beautiful, site to visit their 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 camps uh and cities all along it i mean it's it's a wonderful wonderful experience um but it was always something that was well it was permeable do you know this is not i mean i know it's the wall that inspired rr R. martin for game of thrones the the wall of ice and so on but it wasn't quite like that it was something through which people would come would trade uh, they could send out people as well um, but it was, it was a kind of a statement though. It was a kind of a grand statement, uh, 
but like I said, they, 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 they push forward and, uh, I don't know, maybe a hundred plus kilometers and, you know, built a, a, a subsequent later wall, the Antonine wall, which was massive. That's, um, so, well, the name you know, rings it's, a bell, but what's I that? The name rings a bell, the Antonine wall, but I don't know where it is. Where, can you tell me? I'm, Antonine I'm wall, I mean, I'll, 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 uh, let me give you like a, a, a let's see here, the Antonine wall, because it's not built in the same kind of way. Uh, because there's a, there's a, there's a big ditch and then there's a wall, but the wall's not built all in stone. So let's see here. I'll give you a, it's on the line of the Firth of Forth uh, way up there. Okay. Yeah. So it's all right. Okay. Substantially, you know, but, uh, it is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's 63 kilometers wide. So it's not as wide as the Hadrianic wall, which I think 70 plus, Yeah, but it's definitely something which is, Hey, we're moving in and we're conquering more. And, you know, you're going in about maybe over a hundred kilometers further north. Uh, so the Romans, they, they didn't give up on this idea that they were going to, uh, that they were going to conquer the entire island. I mean, this is just, this is this, you know, it's a funny one. Conquest, conquest brings what it brings, it brings slaves, it brings good, and it brings a great name to an individual, uh, emperor. So Septimius Severus. Okay. So, you know, you've got all your Judeo Claudians, you got the Antonines, you got Hadrian and Antonius Pius. Septimius Severus, you know, he's like the great emperor, uh, in the early one nineties into 211. He dies in 211 in York. You know, he is fighting against these guys again. So, and if you look at the uh, placement of the legions, so you can't think of the Roman Empire, it's huge, right? You can't think of the Roman Empire as militarized. Mostly people are just left to their own devices, they self-govern and so forth, they have to give to Rome its due and so forth and soldiers and whatnot. But that half a million standing army, you have auxiliaries and so on, they're placed mostly in pressure points Right. So you, you're like, you're militarizing Judea. Cause that's always, those guys are revolting left and right historically. And yet you, you got a couple in, uh, you know, in Morocco, uh, you've got some in, uh, uh, Britain, you got some on the Danube. So, but Britain was a place like you guys were troublemakers, you know? <laughs> so it's like, we, we, we're, we're not able to fully conquer. So it was a very interesting place, but well, that meant also it's a, it's a good in place to get, there's an influx of, of getting slaves and, uh, and, and uh, opportunity to, to, to conquer. Um, so it's, you know, Rome never had its, you know, full wish, you know, of, of conquer the entire Island. The whole thing. Well, it's yep. actually, we're worse than the Britons. We're the. The, the Celts, the, yeah, the, the Celts, Gallic you guys were even worse. In no, fact, you guys uh, are like totally, yeah. Psychos. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, well, where I come from. Put that wall is, up and uh, keep those guys away. We, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that's uh, the, the Pictish, yeah. the Picts, yeah. even further, they, they, they were even more Serious. remote. Um, Serious. Yeah. There's, there's, there, there's a couple of, a couple of things I want to make a point about that. You mentioned the, the, the Antonine wall. Yeah. Now that you mention it, I, I think I, I have heard of it. I, yeah. I have heard of it for sure in, in that area, but I just didn't realize what it was. I didn't realize it was a, I just thought it was called a something or other, you know, the, it, 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 it's, it's definitely, I mean, I've been there. Exposed. I've been there. I, I, I have some Scottish friends and I've been up and I've toured around and it's impressive. It's impressive what, what's up there. It's just, it's just not as well right. known. And of course it doesn't have that, that beautiful view in the same way that you get from standing on portions of the Hadrianic wall. All right. Well, that's definitely um, on my next time I'm in Scotland. I'm going to check it out. The other, yeah. the, so the point I was going to make, and this is this is like, um, I don't know. I need to know if it's a fact or not. That yep. the the story goes mm. that during this time there was uh, a, 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 a a son was born to one of the, I don't know if he was a, a diplomat or a politician or whatever he was, some sort of. En envoy of the Roman Empire had a son by the name of Pontius Pilate in a place called Fife, which would have been just where the Justinian Wall starts. It's in the Firth of Forth, just north of that is Fife. Just to just to confuse you with numbers there, mm -hmm. uh, the Firth of Forth 
north of that is Fife, that yeah. bit that sticks out. And uh, this was, he was allegedly, Pontius Pilate was born in Scotland. Have you heard anything about this? No, 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 no. That's, yeah, no, not the case. I mean, like, think about the Romans weren't even there. The Romans, you know, you got it, you're, you're, you're not getting anything Romanized. I mean, the Julius Caesar, and then it's, and then it's really Claudius. I mean, so that's after the fact. The, the, the name, the Way name, and, the and, 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 you know, we have some inscriptions, we have some references to Pontius Pilate. We think his family, I mean, we think he's a Roman from Italy. And the name is, they think it's a Samnite name. So where are the Samnites? The Samnites are like Campania in Italy. Um, so no, he, the guys, I mean, and also it's like, if you're, he had that sort of standing, he's an equestrian, he's there, he's a governor. So he's from, I mean, you're back in the day, it's you're, you're from somebody who's really well established. They're not going to put some okay. guy from the boonies. You there's one other a, thing is a little bit of a a, legacy allegedly. There. I don't know sorry, where that yeah, came from. Allegedly, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm talking over you. I didn't mean to. Okay. The uh, there's a, a story of a, a very uh, well for us a very famous battle uh, called uh, Mons Graupius, and there's and no one actually knows where it was, but apparently it was the the last battle of the Romans in Scotland before they whatever they they left, and mm. le allegedly very very close to where I was born. Very, okay. very close. Have you heard of this one? It was um, the army led by uh, Agricola. Oh, okay. No, but Agricola is like the Domitianic, so that's right before Trajan. So, uh, I mean, you know, we, we, we actually have his, his biography, so we know, you know, the steps and roughly where he was and so on. But, yeah, that, that particular locality, it's not uh, – that's not ringing a bell. But, I mean, but definitely he was a very uh, – it was a very successful general and um, yeah, he brought, let's say glory to the empire. Um, but I, I can't think about that specific uh, location, that's okay. but that's all, it's obviously previous, previous to the Hadrianic wall. So that's the period of like yeah. conquest that so we're going to set this out. So he, he had a lot of great victories. So for you, when yeah. you look at, and we were talking about, we were talking about this on the phone, and we were, and we were talking about how the parallels between what was <coughs> happening back then and what's happening now. And yep. we, you know, we talked about this being a meme, and that women were astounded, thinking that their men were thinking of, that their, their husbands and boyfriends were thinking about sports and beer. I don't know. What it was. And then they'd ask them, what are you thinking? And it was, I'm thinking about the, the fall of the Roman Empire, or I'm thinking about the Roman Empire. And what do you... What do you think is the fascination and what do you think, how do, which parallels are people drawing from that time to what's happening in our current times? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, there are so many different aspects uh, that fascinate us. And I, and, and I think a big part, not just for the men and the boyfriends, it's also the girls and the women, you know, every, so I think it's just the, the appeal to us on so many levels we find relatable because it was a very sophisticated society it really did is like one of the first empires kingdoms that was really focused on the city i mean think about it, throughout all the roman history and all these other you know contemporaries i mean most people are just farmers in majority i mean think about us i mean when we were kids growing up there was a huge percentage of our of our countries in which the population was was uh, just involved in agriculture my, my grandfather in wisconsin had a dairy farm you know, and all they all they all got killed off, you know, by by uh, change in politics and, and, and so on. But um, so it was number one, it's really astounding that that long ago we had these cities and we look at those cities. And in so many cases, you know, walking through the streets of Pompeii or whatever, it, it, it's relatable to us. Hey, there's the corner diner. Hey, there's the fountain. Hey, there's the the entertainment venues and doing things. So I think that that level of relatability, it's just, it's kind of ready made. And then we have all the literature, you know, we have, and then, so the basis of European American, I mean, the basis of so much of that literature that we have today is dependent upon the Dante that then looks to the Virgil that then looks to the Homer. So we have so many things that, uh, that, that we grow up with, uh, we, we understand that the derived from something from that particular time period. 
you know, and we think of the roads and we think of, you know, the development of the Navy and, and, and so on. Look at an arena, look, look, go to a soccer stadium or a football arena, and then you go into the Coliseum or any amphitheater and you're like, Woo, it's, the it's the same thing. It's the same setup with the corridors and the staircases and the concession stands and the bathrooms and, you know, wow. So I think all that sort of stuff. And, and it's interesting, um, you know, just this kind of superficial kind of like, wow, the Romans and it's incredible engineering and the concrete domes that we can actually take a step further and then get immersed and really dig down deep and learn so much more. So I think it's great. I, I'm very pleased that a lot of people are interested in ancient Rome. It's even more pleasing than that we can turn them on to more content and have richer conversations in which you can get even better informed because it was a society that was very diverse, like our own societies. You know, people are coming from all over the Mediterranean. They're coming from beyond the reaches of the empire. Uh, and it was just, you know, so many languages, so many beliefs, uh, so many ideas. Uh, and, and then you have the products left behind. I mean, you know, we, and we live in a throwaway society. So who cares what we make? It's not going to be there in 50 years. These guys made stuff and here we are, we're admiring the stuff. You know, we can, we can get so much out of seeing that history and that art and that architecture and that engineering. We don't build like that anymore because, you know, economies have changed, but, uh, wow. I mean, I think it just really, really strikes us when we go around and we see the remains of these, uh, of these uh, civilizations. Yeah. I was in, as you know, I was in Athens a few months, mm -hmm. a month or so ago, and we were staying in a place in this hotel, just on the edge of the Acro Acropolis. Nice. Acropolis. Acropolis, just there. So I could walk out and you could walk up a few sets of stairs and you were on that, uh, the road, that path that goes all the way around the yeah, nice. Acropolis. Yeah, nice. Very nice. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And we had, a, we went, took the kids up one morning and a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. early as soon as they opened so we could beat all the crowds and uh that's a fascinating place and oh, would yeah. you just love to have seen the parthenon and the, and, the, and the acropolis hill with all those temples or whatever they were used for yeah all the buildings up there in their prime pristine pristine white um marble and just it would have been a marvel and and that was that predated roman oh yeah uh, civilization and so from what I gather, there was because when I went to the, this is a thing when I was in the Rome, the Vatican Museum is they had these uh, loads of st st uh, marble statues from for them ancient Greece for the Romans yeah. this was ancient Greece and exactly. they are unbelievable. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, unbelievable the quality that you think this is. How the hell was this done? It it, it really blows your mind. And one of the points that uh, someone made was that Rome was a continuation of Greece and that Greece was a continuation of Egypt. What's your view on that? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, and, you can look at all from. these different civilizations and uh, I mean, there's, there's lots of overlap and interaction and then, yeah, you can look at it as the handing of the baton or whatnot, but I mean, it's it, Rome and all of its history was always interacting with Greek culture. So it's not like all of a sudden, and then here's Rome and goodbye Greece because yeah. They're interacting, cultural exchange, ideas, trade, art, and all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, the Greek world had, you know, been subsumed under the reign of uh, Alexander the Great. And then, you know, after Alexander the Great, there are all these kingdoms that, that form after his uh, empire dissolves and then en enroll the Romans and, and take them all out. And then the Greeks always knew that well, eventually Rome will fall as well. I mean, the Romans knew it as well, that uh, nothing lasts forever. Uh, very much aware of that. And, uh, and so, but, 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 the, but the interaction between these cultures was always there. It wasn't that Romans conquered the Greek kingdoms and all of a sudden they got exposed to Greek culture. I mean, the, the Greek cities were almost within walking distance, you know. And then you have the Etruscan culture yeah. and the Etruscan culture is also influenced by the Greek culture. And that's, you know, nine kilometers from, uh, from Rome. Some of the early Kings of, 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 uh, of Rome were Etruscan. So it's, uh, it's very interesting that kind of flow and that communication of ideas and art and so forth and beliefs it's right there from the beginning. So, 
uh, Rome was never re really isolated from that culture. And so it's not just, yeah, the Romans copied the Greeks, the Greeks copied the Egyptians, because there are a lot of other cultures that are there. For example, I just was in Saudi Arabia and you look at the uh, Danite uh, culture and its influence and its interaction with Mesopotamia. I mean, it just, it ends up being much more dynamic and much more, let's say, globalized than you can imagine because there are certain critical paths throughout the uh, area of the Mediterranean, like the, 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 you know, later on there's a silk road, you know, but there's the, there's the incense road, uh, bringing uh, incense was a huge commodity. And so it gets trafficked from basically Yemen through the Arabian Peninsula and then in, into the Mediterranean. So there's just different kinds of conversations and interactions going along with that trade and beliefs. It ends up being really fascinating. So I think the starting point is, I think about the Roman Empire, and then you can learn a lot more and see how much connection there is, how much diversity there is uh, within that empire. It's actually quite fascinating. Yeah, it is. It's, it was, I mean, it, there's so many there's countless books about the subject yeah. uh, and you know you mentioned the fact that most people don't realize that the roman empire continued on for another pretty much a thousand years yeah uh the other thing is that the egyptian empire uh towards the end was um the, the ptolemaic yeah. empire if you want to call yeah. it that and uh ptolemy the original the first one was a, a friend of alexander the great he he stayed behind <laughs> and he took over. So when you have this Netflix show on about Cleopatra being oh, yeah. an African woman. Uh, yeah. No, it's just Greek. Yeah, <laughs> Macedonian, is, exactly. This exactly. is forgotten. Yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, again when, yeah. when, you, when you're telling history and you're doing a dramatization and so on and so forth, you've got a lot of leeway. You've got uh, Ridley Scott doing uh, Napoleon and people up in arms because this didn't happen and that didn't happen. But he's, hey, I'm telling the story. You know, I got... I got a yeah. couple hours to tell That's the story. Point. I got to, I got to move the narrative and, you know, having him with his troops taking pot shots at the Sphinx. I mean, Hey, you know, so it's it, that, that I mean, that's what you get with the, with, with Joe's. But if you're, but if you're saying you're doing it, if you're saying you're doing something really historically accurate, then you better hold to it. But if you're just, you know, yeah. telling a sweeping, you know, you're entertaining people, I suppose you, you I'd say yeah, you get more, you get more leeway, but listen, movies also like that. I mean, Gladiator is a great movie, right? It doesn't get everything right, but it didn't intend to get everything right. It got a lot of people great interested film. in ancient Rome. So, I mean, I think it, it, it's, it, yes, it, it, did. it served its purpose. I mean, even Indiana Jones, when he's gay, guys, a tomb robber, for goodness sake, he's stealing everything he's sticking in a museum. This is exactly <laughs> what you shouldn't do, yeah, no. but it's gotten people interested. I mean, I'm a little kid. I saw this stuff when, you know, I, it came out in whatever, 81 or whenever it was, I was a little kid. That stuck with me. I mean, wow, how exciting. Traveling to foreign lands, learning languages, making discoveries, you know, learning about, uh, you know, those contemporary cultures. What's not to like, you know? So now, not it everyone becomes in an museum. but some of us do. <laughs> it's, it's, you actually followed the path. I thought it'd be quite fun, but I was watching it, funnily enough, I was watching it with my son just a few weeks ago. I mean, it, we, he wanted to, he hadn't seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I thought, well, there's bits in that. We'll probably give him nightmares. But he said his friends have all seen it and they said it was brilliant. So it was mainly the melty facey bit, you know, at the end. Um, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. But I was watching it and I, and I was I was giggling to myself because at the time it was such a fantastic, it still is a great movie, mm -hmm. but it was such a, such a great film. And then I was thinking... He's a great, that's what he is. He's a grave robber. And then he comes out and justifies it by saying, this belongs in a museum. And the, uh, uh, yeah. And you, you've got yeah. the Elgin marbles, which you've yep. got the Rosetta Stone, okay. which is in London. Yep. Yep. These, all these things that the, 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 the Egyptians and the Greeks want back. Yeah. And they just won't give them back. It's just well, pure they're fact. Complicated. It's, I mean, they're also complicated. They're complicated narratives <laughs> associated with those, those works of art. I mean, you know, so you've got like... Uh, you know, Turkish occupation of Greece for 400 years, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's not quite cut and dry. I, I'm, I'm all I in know. favor of I them know. being returned. I mean, I'm all in favor of them being returned, but like, you know, the, the, the thing is, I mean, the, 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 the British museum has its mandate and they're afraid, you know, if they give something back, they're going to be giving everything back, which, you know, but the way that, but that's the way museums were collected. You, you, you took artifacts and you showed your population, look, 
here's a slice of the world. I went to the Smithsonian as a kid. You know, I, that's my first experience in the international stuff. You go to the museums in, I don't know, Chicago or San Francisco, and you'd see a bit of the world. I mean, that's just how museums were, were formulated. Yeah. Uh, but obviously I'm living in Rome where like, hey, everything's from here. Everything is, I mean, this is superior because it was found here. It's owned by the people. It's managed by them and they put it on display. That's, that's the best. But the rest of the world says, well, we, we want to show, you know, we want a mummy. <laughs> we want a little piece of the, yeah. of the, of the Parthenon or whatever. And that doesn't, I mean, nowadays it doesn't really hold water. So people are coming to terms with that. And also the huge, you know, industry of, of looted artifacts. I mean, you've got it. If you've got something great, but you better have the provenance, you better be able to show that you got it properly. Because if you didn't, you should give it back. Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah, that's that's that the way it should though. be. Or there's make a, a lot, or listen, a, movie, make, a lot of them are cutting music. deals. You know, you cut a deal, you say, okay, we'll give it back. And then the home institution says, okay, you can keep it for 50 years. Do you know what I mean? Make the deal where everybody's yeah. happy, but don't, don't pretend, you know, don't, don't deny because people are coming after you. Yeah. <laughs> As they should. There's a museum, there's a museum in Turin, uh, yeah. yeah, Turin. Which yeah. I want to, the Egyptian Museum in Turin. It's one of the there? greatest mu museums, uh, and 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 they and they have all the stuff, and they have it ethically, and they have it legally, and everything's great. I mean, this this stuff's not going back. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna go there this as soon as it's possible. It's amazing, basically. It's I'll see you far. there. It's we only can go together. Three... All right, that's a date. I will definitely. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll pop up for that. That's I love good. it. Yeah. Yeah. Any excuse? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Yeah, absolutely. We should form a yeah, team. Now it's too cold. Twenty bucks and you coming. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll do it in the spring. It's nice there in yeah, the springtime. Sure. That's a good place to end, Daria. Okay. Darius, Darius, Daria, Darius. It's a. It's such a fascinating subject. You know, this we can't cover everything in a podcast, it's just, but yeah. it was just interesting to get your take as a as an expert, and to counter some of the stuff I you read that we read. Um, and start, well, I guess research a little bit for yourself, but what you read online and, uh, yeah, that was really awesome. I've been so excited about this chat from, yeah, my, me too. For real, months real and pleasure. Months. yeah. And, uh, yes, Egyptian museum, Turin, we can, we can we make a tour and invite people along. Yeah. That's a pass. date. Yeah. We'll, we'll find some, it. some moment we can. <laughs> <laughs> bring the kids or not bring the kids, whatever. But Turin's a really cool town as yeah. well. Everyone knows it very well. Yep. Ah, right. Okay. I've been there a couple of times. So, um, so once more, just let us know what your YouTube pages and your yeah. your social medias, and so people can come and check yeah. you out. All, all my social media is Darius Aria Diggs, D A R I U S A R Y A Diggs, and uh, YouTube channel is Darius Aria, and the nonprofit is Ancient Rome Live. And in all these things, it's showing you weekly, you know, great exhibits, travel, adventure on my channel, uh, contemporary world surrounding the ruins. But to the Institute, it's really the access to the sites and museums uh, as, as they unfold and really in real time. So I, I don't think there's anyone out there that's able to produce this stuff on a weekly basis, you know, that's, that's contemporary because we're here. I mean, everyone else, I think, is you know, here occasionally or, or whatnot, they're not, uh, they're not present like we are. So take advantage of that because that's, I think a, a great resource for you. Yeah. Um, I endorse that. I, I watch it often. Um, we get my boy on there soon when he, he's, he's starting to get interested in this kind of thing as well. So it's going to be, okay. it's going to be fun and it'd be great to meet you in person. Darius. Yeah, and, um, I really look forward to that, that trip and, uh, you can follow us on Mr. Kindness, Mr. Kindness on Twitter and also Mr. Kindness underscore pod on Instagram. So thanks for listening. And Darius, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks again. Great to speak to you. All right. All right. Take care. All the best. Bye bye. Bye, man. Have a good one. Talk to you soon.